Yeah, I totally ben, I agree. Yeah, ben is the dad and like, we we don't want Ben to, to like, we don't, we love when Ben teases us, but it also cuts a little. Oh yeah, that's what I mean, totally. Yeah, it's not like a, I agree. There is, uh, okay, I have Paige. Uh, okay. <laughs> Paul just has Scott as the uncle. Yeah, he's or, the, yeah, Scott is drunk um, uncle. Oh, I should say that, and we're live. It is Wednesday, September 29, 2021. It's 5.08 p.m. Eastern time. We're trying to get Paige on to the show. Uh, it's me and Scott doing like what is there has to be some name for like the vaudeville thing where you like come out and like tap dance for like 10 like like trying to buy time or something yeah you know? they were they're like the over, uh, overture maybe or something i don't know we we actually have musicologists in the greek chorus so we have um uh i will bring in paula to kind of fill the time because uh uh I'm really happy to be the cool aunt. That seems like a great. That seems like a great thing. Yeah, the, the, right. Scott is Scott is the oh, oh this one. Scott is the unpredictable relative. Okay, I think that's right. Like sometimes, sometimes he's like he's totally fine, and sometimes he gets into like huge fights about vaccines. <gasps> oh no, I thought it was Paige. It's just Paula. Sorry, Paula. <laughs> <laughs> we were, uh, Paula. We were very excited. Until we saw it was Sorry, Paula. That's not what I meant. I just like the I was like texting and like trying to get all the things together, and then I saw a screen pop up, and I was like, "Oh, it worked!" And then I'm like, "No, no, it's Paula." I asked Paula. Hi, Paula. You had a question for Scott about torts. Yeah, Scott. Do you teach torts? I don't. I can mm -hmm. explain why I have that question, but it's much easier just to. Uh, no, I do not teach torts. I think no. torts is too hard. Can I? like give you my like reason why because i find like, why, to be wait very, why what why i find it really hard no why i'm asking is because i find it very philosophically like like pointed like every question of intention and then like what is harm and like my torts professor is a philosopher and like is this like a philosopher scott, thing scott hershowitz yes yeah well, okay you guys are both named scott <gasps> Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yay. Sorry. That was I, a very bizarre experience. Like, I could uh, see you. It was just, it was very strange. I have no idea what was wait, happening. So yeah, now, got, I'm on, yeah. now I'm on like a really bad camera instead of a good one, but it works. So no, okay. it works. <laughs> can I, can I, before we start, hello, I'm Scott, but can I just Hi. say how, how, how brutally we just treated Paula? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you literally just picked her off. <laughs> herself i was just telling oh okay her. i just felt yeah. like yeah. <laughs> she did it herself i did not like i'm not that i'm not i wouldn't do that i wouldn't be like okay, okay that's enough of you paula <laughs> like, okay okay that's okay, when, okay, like, okay. that's like in vaudeville when they take the hook and they <laughs> you <up. laughs> <laughs> or, or in the gong show right when yeah Paige, it's so great to see you i think the it's last time i saw you was dan's you wedding I know, so nice. I know. Yeah. And they're in Austin, so I'm going to see them like in two days. So, you know, everything's mm. full circle, but literally years right. at this point. It, well, it's so great to see you. Scott, this is Paige. Hi, hi, Paige. Also known as Catherine Paige. Did, did, doesn't it look like she has horns coming oh, out of I? her ears? No, from your ears because of the. Oh, oh, because of her black, like. Yeah, the black thing. So. <laughs> they kinda, do, they do like. Yeah. Like, Look, it's weirdly like they make like, her ears. Oh, yeah. because they bisect them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Oh. No, 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 no. <laughs> you just look like a satar or something or some. Uh, yeah. <laughs> y'all, uh, you know, all of my good equipment like was not connecting with y'all, so you're getting you're getting the B game, but it actually like connects to the internet, so it works. Yeah. I I mean, it, 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 uh, I, I'm. I, it's, uh, welcome to the show. <laughs> we are not allowed to have fun anymore, but after um, 12 minutes of hardship, we are allowed to have Paige Harden. Um, Paige, I am going to call you Paige, but do you prefer Catherine? No, you're just Paige? fine. Okay, yeah, right? Really fine. Um, so, I have to explain this. My mother intended this as a double name, Catherine Page, which is delusional because no one has ever called me that except for her. 
a lot like, of yeah. that's a mouthful. It's a mouthful, but it means that it's like impossible for me, like emotionally, to break up with a Catherine for some reason, and so I use it in writing, and then no one in my life calls me that. So I just managed to confuse everyone. Uh, I would be the only person I know that goes by the short ver the short version of her name, like in everything, like my byline, everything. I was the only person in my law review anyway, and then like. I just like, like, like Molly Brady publishes under Maureen. Yeah. Yeah. That, like, no, and so like, she just like, doesn't like, she just doesn't. And she's like, that's like, a lot of people have that kind of form. Anyway, sorry. You wrote a book. We're going to talk <laughs> yes. about it today. It has your name, all three of them in really big yes. letters. I'm putting it into the chat. Um, I'm going to put the New Yorker, uh, the New Yorker story up in a second. Um, I'm kind of curious, like, if your agent is happy, well, probably happy about the New Yorker story, but also, like, whether or not, like, the New Yorker story is getting more to people are reading the New Yorker, if they're complimentary or substitute goods. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so for the first question is, I don't have an agent. This is part of the weird part of okay. the process, which is that I, you know, I wrote this, this book with, for you in a second. I, I'm going <laughs> to fix that for you. Um, I am in the process of talking to literary agents who are like, mm -hmm. oh, if you if you do this again, like maybe that would be a good idea um, instead of just writing a book and and uh, and selling it to an academic press without without an agent. So um, and then in terms of like, are, you know, are people reading it instead of the book? I mean, it's an academic press book, you know, so in terms I know, of their, it's a Princeton UP, like, yeah, yeah. Princeton University Press, and Princeton... you're getting covered in the New Yorker? <laughs> well, <'cause absurd>. that's, <laughs> that is because people don't realize that Princeton University Press is by far the best university press. Um, uh, and I, and that's not the press I publish with, but um, that place is amazing. What it was the books that it publishes. Um, uh, it's so great that you're on their list. I mean, yeah, oh, it's great. Been, also great. That, God. Yeah. yeah, they've been fantastic. Like they, you know, and the, you know, the publicist at PUP has been working her ass off <laughs> to be mm -hmm. honest. Like I've been really, really grateful for that. Um, but I think it that, you know, they're not introduced well, go ahead. All to anyone. Sorry. Hold on. Like, let me yeah. like, let me slightly back up. Do you, yeah. You have a, you have been, you are at UT Austin as a professor. Yeah. Um, are you tenured yet? Yeah. 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 So wow, I'm really, I'm full, really? which is nice. So I have no more like academic hoops to jump through. I can just like be for forever, which is really nice. That's awesome. So. And what is, and your, and your PhD is in specifically, was it in psychology? It was in psych, it was in clinical psych. So, okay, clinical. That's what I thought. Yeah. So I think the first time I, my path ever crossed with you was when I was living in Boston because I was working at um, McLean Hospital, which is a psychiatric hospital there. Yeah. So I had this weird year of doing inpatient psychiatry work. And then I went on the faculty job market and ended up at UT. So I'm in the clinical psych area there. Um, so, But I don't see patients anymore. I run a research lab and we do psychopathology stuff, um, but I don't. I don't like have a practice anymore. Sam, Sam, Sam Gosling is there, right? Yeah, Sam and I teach together. We teach oh, really? together. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um. So you went in the faculty market. You ended up down in Texas. Yeah. Wait, weren't you somewhere in between? Didn't you do a postdoc or something in Virginia? Am I no. imagining that? Or like, no, no, that was my okay. PhD. And then oh, okay. I, I did my intern year in Boston, and then I went straight to Got my it. faculty job. And so you've been at UT and um, the book is called The Genetic Lottery, Why DNA mm -hmm. Matters for Social Equality. I feel like John, my partner, and I have been talking about this book and your work <laughs> for a while. And before yeah. we knew that you were publishing a book, he was like, you should have Paige on the show. Like, <laughs> she is like, she is talking about all this kind of edgy stuff. And it's in this weird kind of realm of like, people don't want to talk about genetics because there's this idea of eugenics, like, or there's this idea of like Charles Murray, the second you talk about genetics. And so like, uh, but Paige is doing a really thoughtful, smart job with it. And so 
um, kind of walk us into like how you started doing research in this area in particular, and then like kind of what your research has looked like. Yeah. So in, uh, in my lab, like what my lab does, we study how child and adolescent development. So that's um, how children go through puberty, risk for mental health problems, and then um, cognitive abilities in relation to things like ADHD and how they do in school. Um, What's interesting about those kind of domains of human life is that they they set children up for adulthoods that can play out really differently. So if at age 18, you know, um, this is someone's level of executive function. This is when they've started their childbearing or their fertility, or they haven't, they've had contact with the criminal justice system, or they haven't, they've started using substances, or they haven't, they've heard, had like their first experiences with anxiety or depression. That is setting the stage for like very different adult trajectories to come. And so I became increasingly interested in how the work that I was doing on genetic influences on child and adolescent development, um, how that connected with what economists and sociologists were studying in terms of inequalities of outcome much later in life. So when we look down the road, how do people differ in their wealth, income, labor market experiences? Um, and so that seemed to me like a kind of a very natural progression, like your genes and environment combine to shape development and that influences how your life, you know, your trajectories of adulthood. Um, but the public conversation around that line of research is very both polarized and very kind of separated from the scientific conversation that's happening. Um, because if you say genes and education, people immediately think, Charles Murray eugenics race. They don't think um, egalitarian political philosophy and like this is how everything has been transformed by the DNA revolution in the last 20 years. Um, so the book started out as a paper, like I was gonna write a paper on like how I saw like genetics inequality. And then I was like, well, maybe this will be two papers. And then it, you know, like, as you know, like projects tend to take on a lesson. So you went own. to a workshop <laughs> I went to, a, you know, I went to a conference, I got a small grant, I was going to do like one or two academic papers. And um, as soon as I started talking to about these topics with people outside of kind of my narrow scientific subfield, you just end up having the same conversation. Y'all were joking when I was like trapped behind the internet wall where I couldn't see or talk to you about like explaining the same things over and over again. Like, I just was having the same conversations over and over again about like, why is this not eugenics? Or like, what does heritability mean? And so I thought, okay, well, I'll just write this down in one book and then I'll never have to talk about it ever again. Obviously yeah, that's, that's how that works. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah that, no, that's the way academic books work. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because, um, uh, can, I, can I just, I, 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 not to, um, take us off this track because it's fascinating. I just want to know, what was your research before you did this? Because this seems like such a totalizing research program that I'm kind of surprised <laughs> that, that like you kind of just fell into it, so to speak. Well, it, you know, in some ways it's always been this because my, my PhD was in clinical psych, but it was from the very beginning, like how do we use family designs, so twin designs or adoption designs okay. to identify environments that influence children's mental health right so mm -hmm. like my master's thesis was like marital conflict and children's conduct problems like is it actually the exposure to your parents fighting that makes you have conduct problems or is it argumentative adults have argumentative children for reasons that are have to do with like the inheritance of temperament rather than about environmental exposure so the the scientific research has kind of basically always been this what's new is the that kind of outward facing public conversation about it, which is, okay, scientists, you know, in behavioral genetics are talking to themselves, um, but are we moving the general perception of what this work is saying and how we're going about doing it in any way? So that's the part that's, kind of, that's, that's newer for me is um, not just talking to other academics about it. So it's my impression that one of the reasons, like, so here's what, here's what it seems like to me. Let's say it's both nature and nurture. Like, let's just cut it down the middle, right? 
the thing about the nurture element is it seems that there is an element of free will involved. It seems that there is something that can be controlled, that you can then kind of have this kind of like, that we can set social policies to shape it. We can do this type of thing. And the problem in the past of meddling with the, okay, I also wanna say, by the way, hold on, just pause for a second, I didn't say this before that both are just like accidents. Like, let's just accept that both are accidents. You get born into whatever environment that you're gonna be in. And you also get born with whatever DNA and genetics that you're going to have, right? So they're both like complete like crapshoots, right? And like, mm, yeah. and no one believes that one should be deter I hope no, no, no well thinking person thinks that just one alone should be like, should limit or like kind of like control everything about a person's life. Um, the problem is, I think that like in the past questions around the 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 crapshoot of genetics has been like, well, let's fix genetics. Like, yeah. Let's, yeah. Let's, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, no, let's that's get, definitely like, the problem. Let's get some CRISPR action going and like the kind yeah. of like solve <laughs> this problem. Like, but I think that like I think that kind of what you're saying is actually let's bring let's be more recognizing of like the the pro like the baseline of where a person is starting from genetically and like yeah. moving forward or no yes i mean broad brushstrokes yes so i think this is one of those like things that things were in you when you write something for a general audience and then you start talking about it you realize like this seemed obvious to me but it's not at all obvious and well, i think one of the obvious things in the field is that things can have genetic causes but environmental solutions or environmental changes so that the, the yeah. classic yes. example that everyone exactly. talks about is like eyeglasses right like you have genes that you know make it such that like your yeah. lens cannot properly refract light and we deal with that environmentally um it's harder for people to think of those types of examples when we're talking about something social or behavioral um but they're there's just they're there well, right? i can like, give you so, an example we don't let hate. We don't let a fifteen thousand Haitians that happen to be born in Haiti like into the United States because yeah. like we have all of these rules and like that. I mean, just things like that. Like there's just like these environmental things that there's many, 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 many layers of things that we put on top of it. But like, yeah, we're not. There's yeah. social structures, right? Yes. But so, but I think it it feeds into this kind of like, you know, if something's genetic, then we can only fix it with like CRISPR or like you know embryo screening is what makes people nervous, but we do environmental responses to gen genetically caused things all the time, right? Like the way to fix the fix or the way to mitigate the risk of alcohol use for a teenager that's high in genetic risk for alcoholism is to send their family to family therapy, right? And then their genotype isn't as predictive of their alcoholism anymore. That's a real example. Like th those are the sorts of things in which we're using like, genes influence this which we can then intervene on environmentally that is intuitively hard but like i think really really important in terms of intervention scott wants to get it uh, so that, yeah because i i feel like i have the perfect line but good go <laughs> <laughs> because the thing is what you're describing is first of all it's a, what you just said i, I mean in my humble opinion, is an incredibly important point. It's in some sense an instance of the genetic fallacy, right? The but so it's the genetic genetic fallacy. Yeah, yeah. No, 100%. Genetic fallacy. Genetic fallacy. Can I get a, I, in my head it sounded way better. But, <laughs> genetic genetic fallacy. No, but, no, but it, it, the, the fact that genetics should be the origin of problems does not mean that there can be therefore no um, amelioration of yeah, this because that's to, that's a, that's a, that is an instance of the genetic fallacy. Um, uh, but but I, can I say one thing? So one of the things that you said was I thought was really fascinating, which actually pushes in the opposite direction was that, of course, when you say things like genetics being the cause of it's, it's nature, not nurture, you think Charles Murray racism. But as you pointed out, you could also be thinking in terms of egalitarianism. And what I 
what I thought you meant, and correct me if I'm wrong, is this kind of intuition that, you know, was 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 written about most famously by John Rawls, but then um, uh, uh, carried on by others. That is this the idea of the genetic lottery. That is yeah. that what you like do, her, what you do in life. Book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Rawls used the phrase the natural lottery, right? Which was like, yeah, but I mean, exactly. So I think it's both. I, I'm sorry, right, right, then, I'm, I'm, you I, I'm sorry, you, you, no, no, I just say, you're right. That's exactly right. The genetic lottery is the name of your book. The natural lottery. He used it. And and so that's a that that's a really arresting idea. The I, I I so I guess the question is that's what obviously you were mirroring with the with the terminology of the Rawlsian. Yeah, definitely. One hundred percent. I mean I talked oh, okay. about this in the like the last the last the last chapter of the book most obviously, but it's through there, which is you know, I think genetics is important scientifically because it helps us understand how do children develop. And if we want to design, you know, interventions or therapies or policies, then it helps to understand like what is going on with kids. And understanding child development is just really, really hard to do if you ignore the fact that they're different from one another in ways that are, you know, systematically correlated with, you know, the environments that their parents are providing for them. And then I think it's also important in terms of, like it can be important rhetorically as this kind of nudge around, you know, away from like, what do we deserve versus if we took seriously, like the role of luck in people's lives, like both genetic and environmental, as Kate said earlier, it's all a crapshoot. Like what kind of structure would we want? Like given the infinite number of possibilities that like you could have genetically for your children like what would you want for them and thinking about the social structures that are good um so yeah I'll, I'll, kate has a thought well i just i don't i don't have kids we don't have kids um you have two adorable children that i see all the time on instagram and facebook um but one of the things that strikes me about your kids is like and all all, all of my friends kids and watching them have them, this is the benefit of having children late in your life. It's like the basically, you get to watch all of these like pipe dreams of like, I'm gonna, I actually remember really clearly there was a kid at Brown who was like, I'm gonna make my kid learn to walk on his hands. <laughs> like, I'm just going to like, like he's just gonna learn to walk on his hands when like alongside learning to walk like learning to walk normally and that's and this that person like, clearly had never been around children <laughs> before right 20 yeah i know like it was but it was just kind of a it was just like the yeah, level right. of conceit I, it wasn't like chinese it was like yeah. walking on your hand like an interior like um but i just kind of i think that this is this important point which is like i think every parent at some point confronts this which is like there is this ideal or this kind of thought process of of the free will you have and you want to exert on something else and then the free will that comes back at you uh that they have and their own kind of like everything that is like packaged into them that is not you it is like no. part of you yeah but it is not you and the yeah. weird combination of the two so yeah yeah you know it's it's they are their own people right like they are not they are not pets and they are not projects they are their own people and i think having especially having more than one child for me is even as someone who studies this is this like daily confrontation with they have they have come into the world with their own natures and that is um not destiny but definitely is um like part of their development that I'm observing and I'm, you know, I'm attempting to shape like as a mother, you know, I don't think any parent is like, ah, I'm, like I give up here entirely, but like you reach the limits of like, they're their own people. Right. And they're half me and they're half their dad, but those have been recombined in new combinations that are uniquely theirs. Um, there's a study I talk about in the book where they ask a bunch of people to just like guess, like how much do you think genes influence things? You know, like on a, you know, 100, 0% to 100%, like how much do you think genetics has an influence on like height or eye color or schizophrenia? And 
Um, it's moms of more than one kid who are the most accurate in their guesses, like compared to like the scientific consensus. And I think it's because they're just observing difference in their lives. And like, you know, that people who are starting in the same place environmentally are not the same people, like they're their own people. Hmm. Yeah, right. The, the, the thing is that like um, this idea that um, uh, parents have this ability to shape their kids' behavior. You're like, has never spent an hour with a kid. I mean, like getting getting them to do anything is is is, yeah. is really difficult. Well, they're shaping they, you too at the same you know, time, right? <laughs> yeah, right. For, for, um, it's a. It, I I felt like it was an intergenerational transfer of life force. Um, <laughs> um, so it, 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 I, I guess I, I, what is the most surprising pushback you have gotten from your book? The most surprised, that is a really good question. I would say I have been the most surprised by the pushback that is people agreeing with me, but acting as if it's a disagreement. Like there have been a couple of reviews in which people say like, um, you know, what is important isn't just our genes, but like how social structures respond to our genes. And I'm like, yes, I know. I literally, like I literally wrote a book that says that. Like that is the thesis of the book, right? right. So like, it's well, really dislocating. Um, like there's enough yeah. controversy to talk about without like imputing without imputing controversy that isn't there. And so that's the thing that's been surprising to me. Right, so far. Right, right. That is, you didn't expect to be criticized using the thesis of your own book. Yes, that was not <laughs> <the movie. laughs> yeah. that is that is jujitsu level um, that's a, that's what we that's what we teach at the highest level of academe is how to do that. <laughs> I I mean I'm like actually very curious if the New Yorker really was a beautiful setting of the stage of qualifying you among progressives too. Like, I feel like it did the work that I would have like, never have been able to have like the type of impact in the New Yorker, but like I would have tried to do on this show, which is like to show that like Paige is like a social progressive and she believes all these things. And this is like a much deeper kind of like, don't, don't just like, just because you mentioned DNA like doesn't mean yeah. that like you're going that you're so like what do you think about that like that was just such a interesting yeah no i think i mean i think that you're right es especially for people who don't know me or this line of research at all right for people who've come into this conversation kind of cold or with only a few kind of touchstones of like in the background um you know the book is written from a personal place in terms of my own social and moral political commitments and like my experiences as a mother and the New Yorker article like presented me, but the work through like who I, like who I am. Right. And, and so personalized it, um, you know, Gideon was amazing to work with because he was so detailed. Like I've talked to a lot of science journalists over the course of my career. And usually you spend like an hour or two on the phone with them. He's the only person I've ever worked with. That's like, well, you mentioned this article. So I went and talked to that person and here's their more recent article and here's a footnote from it. And here's the reference from it. And like what, you know, it was, it was incredible. Have you written for detailed. the New Yorker? Let me guess what that, let me tell you what that pays. <laughs> <laughs> And it does make a really good piece of journalism. <laughs> I was just like, oh my gosh. Um, I think, you know, there was, um, for people that are already in this space, you know, and whose work is um, close to it, I think it just must have been very weird for them. Like, it would have been really weird for me to, like, suddenly see a colleague of mine who, like, I talked to and has been talking about these things for a year. So all of a sudden be like packaged in the way that the New Yorker packages you. And I have to say, I think academics just have like a very bizarre relationship with the New Yorker, like as a magazine, like it, it, I don't think the response to the piece would have been the same if it had been another outlet for, for whatever reason. Well, that's, yeah. Yeah. That's, I, that's why I have refused to be profiled by the New Yorker. <laughs> 
actually you have to uh, hold the line. I, I I I don't need that in my life. So. <laughs> um, I I do think that there is. Um, so what has been like as you've been doing all of the book stuff? What has been the most interesting kind of interviews that you've had, or we're bringing people in just to ask you questions? Oh, okay. Um, but um, what have been like kind of the most? Has there been any? Have there been any complete kind of moments where people kind of try to like? Are they very respectful, or are they? You know, how's it gone? Like, what's the rollout? Been like? It's been all over the place, right? Like, it has been like. Um, very creepy people emailing my university email address about like me not wearing shoes in the New Yorker photo, like, um, like on the worst side, um, all the way up to was it Tom Nichols? <laughs> Sorry, I'm <laughs> joking. Tom, you know this, Scott? Tom Nichols, like Radio Free Tom, like has a huge hang up with people not wearing shoes. He hates bare feet, like hates them. Sorry, I, it's I, like. Can... I, I, can I just say one thing? Yeah. I, I, I about my feet. Uh, I, I don't <laughs> mind bare feet. I don't. I don't have a foot thing, but I cannot stand when my socks get wet. I think that's. I normal. know this about you. No, I no, no. That. But like that will ruin my day. Like <laughs> I will. <laughs> I will spiral into it. No, no. Like the idea of like getting. Or one sock wet, like that is like the worst. Like, anyway, yeah. go, go ahead. I, you're, you're, I, not, I, so you had you had no socks on in the in the um, in the preview in the picture of the New Yorker. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So that's been like the creepy bit, and then there have been people like who were like I, you know, that are basically like I I'm convinced. Like I agree that um, you know. Uh, intervention research needs more genetics. <clears throat> Policy research needs more genetics. Like, this is, these are my connections to like the foundations or funders. Like, how can we, how can I help with this? Like, what, who can I put you in touch with? And that's really exciting because I feel like um, any projects that build, that lead to One, building two, infrastructure two. seem, seem, Ex like one, two. that's actually moving things. I'm hearing one, two. Yeah, I'm hearing okay. you, David. You have to mute yourself. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know. I was like, am I hallucinating this? No, no, I, don't. no, I, I heard it. Yeah, actually I, a man I, I, muttering one too. Yeah. <laughs> See, so, no, it, so I think that that's like a very strange set of generally in the academic community, which is who you would expect to kind of be like sending a university press book off into. Like, do you feel like it's gotten like good reception? Are there things that you feel like you would revise about it or that you wish you would look harder at? Um, I think it has gotten, I mean, it's been mixed reception in the sense that like there have been negative reviews and positive ones. Um, Aaron Panofsky, who, you know, is a sociologist of science, who like literally has made his career kind of as like a critic of genetics, right? Like his tenure book was like about behavior genetics being bad, wrote like a decently positive review on science. And I thought, okay, like that is a good, like if someone is like, you know, who is a kind of a professional critic of this field is writing in science and definitely has disagreements about my characterization of the left, but not really of my characterization of the science in it. Um, like, I, like I was heartened by that review. I think right now I'm too close to it. Like, it's really hard to know like how much of this is, um, I should have done something differently and I'm just feeling defensive versus it really is bad faith or trivial. And so I feel like I just need to like marinate on it for a little while before yeah. I can tell uh, yeah, what can, I would have done differently. Can I, can I, can I say uh, um, apropos of this, cause I've thought a lot about it cause I published a book a couple of years ago that also was very polarizing um, and it's funny, I was talking, I was in the middle of it when I was talking to a colleague of mine, Sam Moyne, who has also written very polarizing books. And um, I asked him, like, how do you feel about like, 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 do you feel, I mean, he had been a couple of years from it. And I said, how do you feel about the whole experience? He said, I feel like I learned things from it. Um, and um, and so I actually found that very heartening because I thought, 
oh, even though this is kind of, it feels tumultuous. Um, and, uh, and I actually, I felt it somewhat unpleasant um, um, because, because it's in the public sphere, you don't control it and stuff like that. Um, nonetheless, it would, I would learn from it. And I feel like I did actually learn a lot from it. And my guess is you will learn from it too, but it, it, but it, it there is a sense in which it's, it, 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 it's not the best feeling to be. <laughs> Well, it's a it's such a vulnerable feeling. Yeah, right. right. So, well, that's exactly yeah, right. Yeah, there is a vulnerability around having people, like even if you went into it, and I did, being like, I want people to talk about this, right? Like, I want to start a conversation about it. You know, art is personal, and writing is personal, and watching that be debated feel vulnerable in a way. So I just when my when my PhD students get reviews back on a paper, I'm I am always like, you're not allowed to reopen this email for two whole weeks. And then you will write like the angry version of the response letter that's like, <laughs> you imbeciles did not understand the genius of my work. And then you will delete it. And then we can talk about like what you actually need to change. And so I'm just trying to give myself that, that, that grace. Advice. <laughs> like this is what you will do. And then you will not publish the like you imbeciles version. And then you will reflect on it. And then I can respond like a reasonable sure. human. Right, because would, nobody, nobody yeah. ever looks, nobody ever looks good when they write an angry response. Yeah. Um, it, it like it almost, it almost never works. No, like, no, you're yeah. right. Yeah, I agree with that. I also think unless someone leaks that angry response to Ooh, like, yeah, yeah, or, yeah. <laughs> <or like laughs> yeah. I was just, I, I feel like, I'm, like there's been like a bunch of that kind of stuff going yeah. on lately. There's like some type of like yeah. screed email someone sends when they leave Google and like, like <laughs> feel cathartic yeah. because of it. Ma yeah. Maybe put our PGP um, um, uh, uh, key in the chat in case somebody wants to send exactly. us a Exactly. Leak us yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. Totally. <laughs> uh, David, I cannot un. I cannot un I cannot make you appear or make your mic turn on. I think you've like taken away my captaining abilities. <laughs> um, if you are there, David, you there? Yeah, uh, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, I don't know why, but um, this is a super interesting page. Um, Question, should people think very carefully about the risks of genetic testing? And here I'm talking about consumer uh, testing such as 23andMe. What is the worst thing that could happen? I think it's pretty <laughs> bad, but interested in your thoughts as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm going to pivot your question a little bit um, because I think what, what often people don't quite realize is that you are not totally in the driver's seat about managing your risk in terms of uh, consumer genetics com uh, companies um, because your DNA is not just your DNA, right? So like basically by this point, like every European ancestry person in America is like probably genetically identifiable from like one of the major um, direct-to-consumer genetics companies, right? Like if you've ever done one of these, you see like, here are my 27 third cousins that are everywhere. Um, you know, with each of those people, you share a little fragment of your genome, but like how much of your genome is reconstructable from the genomes that are already in these databases? So I like, I don't think this is a question of like, you know, um, how people should manage their own risk in terms like of worst right. case scenario in terms of interacting with these direct consumer genetic companies like they already have an enormous amount of genetic information about people that affects everyone that's sort of identifiable from anyone who's in that database um in terms of the worst case scenario i'm going to decline to answer that question because i think i think those kind of like purely just dystopian directions like push it in any direction you can probably come up with a dystopia and i think probably the worst case scenario is something that we're not anticipating right now that's the other thing about technology is that it's bad use cases tend to surprise us um i will say that i think that's why it's really important 
to articulate the other side, which is like, well, then what's the best case scenario? Like, what is the ways in which this technology could be used in for good instead of for harm? Um, there's a lot of people thinking about the like dystopian elements, but what if, I don't, I, I, I think part of my, my general work is like, we shouldn't just be thinking about the, the spectrum of like from neutral, like you found out your risk of now powder and baldness from 23 me to like catastrophic, but like the other side too, which is like, can this actually be used um, for good? What is the good side of 23? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm so I'm glad not, you asked that yeah. because I thought um, part of me is missing the appeal. Yeah. So like, yeah. I okay. So besides testing for things like BRCA, right? Like, right. like, just... like kind of like things that you can actually get out in front of and do proactive measures to like do things, which we don't need full genetic workups to like figure out by the way. But like that type of, like the rest of it just seems privacy invasive at like, there's one dystopian future at worst. And then like, there is, I will say this, there is like an interesting element of connectivity and people finding like lost relatives and things like that. And like that cuts both ways. Yeah, that definitely cuts both ways. Like, right. not everyone like, wants to know that their not father everyone wants and their to know. father Some or people really they have want a half sibling somewhere. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. So, those cut both ways. But, like, there's this. I Okay, so I work in technology a lot. Like, and there's this question all the time. Like, you said that we can't, like, plan for worst case scenarios or bad use scenarios. We, like, can't even imagine them. Well, we can, really, but, like, but we I can, think we're, yeah. But not all of them, but you're right. And like, but I will say that like, there's some questions, like one of the things that I battle all the time and I generally have the take of like, well, we've created the technology and so we're going to use it. And people are kind of like, well, why? Why can't we ban the technology? Why can't we ban facial recognition or consumer 20 or consumer DNA tests? Um, and I-, I The really, interesting thing about, yeah. so we've been talking about 23andMe it's also interesting to think about like how the US like research landscape is different from other countries. So my colleagues who are working in like Finland or in UK, like there's national biobanks, right? That are like collected by government researchers and then, you know, are available to public researchers, like to, to re the research community in a certain way. And there's like a certain consent around them. Um, and working with UK Biobank as an investigator is like very different from working with 23andMe data where you're like dependent on like asking for genetic information from a private company. You know, it's like a, just a very, very different situation. Um, so I think there's kind of two separable issues here, which is like what, yes, what like is when we talk about the technology, are we... <laughs> yeah, like, are we, like when we talk about the technology, are we talking about like the genotyping of humans, or are we talking about the genotyping of hum humans by for-profit companies that then sell that data to other research, like researchers and other the pharmaceutical companies and other things? Because I think those are not necessarily the same. Like they've come, they've come to be the same thing in the U.S., but not everywhere. Interesting. Like. Scott, am I like alone in thinking that like I the last thing I possibly want is the U.S. government having a biobank? Yeah, actually, the the um, what's uh, I actually have a student right now who's writing a a, a paper an SAW a supervised analytical research paper exactly on the fact that there are these massive databases um, out there already um, uh, that governments. Uh, are are controlling, and they want to um, they want to increase um, the DNA coll genetic collection uh, vastly. Um, in particular, there's been um, regulations about getting the genetic uh, getting the genome of anyone who passes through immigration. I mean, this is unbelievable. Um, and I went um, to China and they did retinal scans like on me when, and like handprints, 
handprints and they took my fingerprints and handprints and retinal scans when I went through wow. when I went through China and I was going to Thailand. I wasn't even like stop it. It was like a layover. Sorry, mm -hmm. I just like threw it. Wait, you passed out. through, so now you're in there. Forever. I know exactly. I was like, that's not even fair. <laughs> like I didn't even like get to do right. anything fun. Anyway, so 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 the point that I, I, I take it getting back to the I the the thing about 23 and me i take it your point is that you it's not like possible for real for individuals really to have um individual action to have um kind of collective effect because it, it's already done like there's already critical mass has been hit and the only way you the only way we'll be able to deal with these problems is to is, is through political is through political action through legislation regulation things like that is, is that is that correct yeah no that's exactly what i'm saying right. like i don't think that your individual choice to not be genotyped by 23 and me gets yeah. out of the fact that like genomics will change your life right like or <laughs> <Yeah>. pass <laughs> um, right. is what i'm saying right. i want right. to say i want to say that i thought that this would change my i thought that i'd be able to get out of this by having my parents i gave my parents a christmas gift of 23 and me like 10 years ago and was like here you guys spit into this tube <laughs> <laughs> this won't affect me uh, i don't really think i understood what i was having them do at the time anyway right yeah uh... It's yeah, I, I had I had the same thing when I gave my um, my parents coal to burn um, <laughs> into the environment. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, it's go really ahead. good. Um, yeah. Richard, <laughs> so nice to see Hi. you. Hi, hello, nice to see you. Um, this is this is really fascinating. Um, Paige, I heard your um, interview on WBUR. Oh and, yeah. Uh, it, this, this is uh, this is more relaxed. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> uh, NPR, yeah, it's a little bit. That, more that was a pretty NPR. intense interview, uh, yeah. but I, I, I really I, I commend you actually for your bravery in taking up this topic. <laughs> um, so um, I was adopted, and uh, years later I found my birth parents. And what was surprising to me, there, there were some similarities that weren't surprising because uh, the family, the household I grew up in, did have a lot of similarities. Um, there were, um, you know, we're both households very concerned about education, um, uh, concerned with education. And so that was, uh, you know, so you were going to go to school and uh, learn about ideas and things like that. But the, the things that surprised me were the, some of the little, uh, little things that I wouldn't have thought about. For example, by, um, uh, I'm kind of a, a pig like my uh, bio dad was. And um, then I, um, you know, I also, like you haven't been able to tell, I have this tendency that I got from my bio mom uh, to be boundlessly loquacious. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, at the same time, there's the other side where, you know, I, I guess what you would consider a niche interest in uh, classical music, and yet my bio family also had that. So I, I, I'm curious, how do you, how are you able to separate out the, the social and the genetic? I mean, not that? just a niche interest in like bio, in like classical music, Richard. Like you are a musicologist. <laughs> like you well, I am, I am <laughs> now, but. <laughs> Yeah, we gotta understand it. In it. Yeah. yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so the thing about separating out the nature and the nurture is that you can never do that when you're thinking about the development of one person, right? Like in the life of one person, it is almost always impossible to pull apart the braid of nature and nurture, right? Like it is, it is both they interacted, they combined, they transacted, and that is what development is, is that constant interplay between the two. It's really more thinking about like, of all of the, you know, if we studied like a sample of people and looked at like how interested are people in musicology in general, right? Like how much of that variation can we account for by being raised in the, you know, a family that like, 
force listens classical music to you as a child versus genetic differences between people. And that distinction between like nature and nur nature versus nurture, like for a person rather than nature versus nurture in terms of explaining variation, like between people is a, is a, like a, it sounds like a technical point, but like it, it turns out to be really important, I think, for making sense of what genetics tells us. Like genetics is never saying to you that like your family environment is unimportant for your development. It's saying that when we're thinking about why people differ, what are the, 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 the sources of variation? I'm smile. I was smiling during your story because one nice thing that's happened out of the New Yorker story is that I've gotten so many emails from people who are very different from their siblings, are very different from their parents, are very similar to their adopted parents who they are to their biological parents who they discovered in adulthood. And these stories of like the ways in which we are like and, and dislike each other in our family. I love, I like, I love hearing those. I feel like that's part of why I got interested in this topic. To begin I with. mean, like being like, so this is, well, sorry. I, now I'm going to make kind of a cognitive science point, which is like being like liking someone. It's not like, it's not the same thing as being a like someone, even though yeah. you might say, like, I might say like Paige and I are so alike. We are just like, we, it, I say that because I really admire you and I think that we have a lot of co like complementary traits, but that doesn't mean not to bring it back to complementary institution. Like <laughs> actually like I that does not mean we're that, similar like, phenotypically. Okay, like, we're similar. Well, yes, we are phenotypically similar, but like my dad and I like are ex like have many of the same traits and we fight like cats and dogs <laughs> we see the same traits in each other and kind of hate them right yeah, like and there's yeah. like there is kind of some and that's a very typical thing but like I think that that's kind of an interesting part of like saying that you're like someone or not like someone or finding kind of like finding an adopted family outside of your actual family whether you do that later in life or at the very beginning so. Yeah. Kate, what I what I told people is that I one of the disadvantages of not having um, grown up with my bio parents is that the things that like my that my mother does that annoy me they um, I do them too, and I know that if I'd grown up with those annoyances, I might have learned not to do them. So. <laughs> it turned I don't know. know. I think you turn into your parents, and you're like. Yeah. <laughs> No, you That's do them I, anyway. Like yeah. John, constantly I complain. This my mom does this thing where she says like, "Okay, I'll see you later. I love you," and then she asks you three more questions on the phone, <laughs> and this drives me bonkers. Like I literally cannot. Like I'm just like, Shh. I was like, we were just about to hang up. Like why didn't you ask these earlier? Why did you pretend we were gonna hang up? And then she's just kind of you know. And then I do that with John, and he's like, "You are you're." you're <laughs> Pot kettle. Uh, yeah. So that's, yeah, I think that's true. Richard, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, you know, when you yeah. were saying about like the the family that you that you um, that you kind of build, you know, regardless, and like your affinities for people. The beginning of um, Andrew Solomon's Far from the Tree, right, which is like an enormous book, but like I, it's still worth reading, and it's all parents. Who are very different from their children in some way so it's like deaf children of hearing parents or children with profound disabilities or who like have these profound abilities in certain ways but he has this really great part in the first chapter about horizontal versus vertical identities like what part of your like your family is like inherited from your parents versus what part of your family and your identity do you find in finding people who are similar to you in the ways that you're different from your family and it's just such a lovely kind of set up for the whole book that like theme of difference and connection yeah that's really great um we're gonna bring paula back on because everyone thinks that i paula bring yourself back on i don't know why i can't like <laughs> you, say you should ever here paula like paula like just like i'm like that i like beat up paula and just like banished her paula i, I think you have to untoggle my video no, I, I am untoggled. It's not doing it. Okay, well, whatever. Polly, I can't hear Scott. I can't hear Scott either. Scott, 
You did, did you mute yourself on purpose, uh, Scott? Yeah, yeah, uh, I did. I did. I did. <laughs> just to screw with you. I did. I, I would just say, like, Kate, why are you doing this to Paula? You won't. It, first, you kicked her off. Now you won't turn on the video. What? Yeah. What is? Jacob I said know. that I yeeted myself out of the uh, crowdcast. Yeah, she's just like so. Um, Paula, do you have any questions before we before we uh, close out? Um, I mean, are we fucked? Is that is that what I? Paula's <laughs> 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 yeah, just... Paula is Paula's like twenty years old, and as <laughs> As a law student at the University of Michigan, and is brilliant, and I. But she's also from the mouth of babes. So, uh, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. I think yes, but not because of genetics or Facebook, but because of climate change. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's the hot take. Is it? Is that is, where the progressives are putting their babies? That's what. It is. <laughs> yeah, that's like, I I kind of agree with that, actually, yeah. Scott, how do you think we're fucked? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I mean, there's no question that climate change. Um, I had delusions that when things got really bad, we would all come together and do it. But like COVID completely um, disabused me of the ability. I mean, people won't even take the cure. Yeah, yeah, I was, thinking, I, was, I, was, I was actually thinking that the funniest thing's going to happen, which is that the, <laughs> Pfizer or Moderna is going to come up with a cure for cancer, right? They're going to like do the silver bullet cure for cancer, and half the country is not going to take it. Um, and like, we're going to be like, like, dude, we can't get cancer, and they'll be like, you can't. So anyway, I think that that's um, uh, that's why I think we're fucked because we can't even take the cure that we have. It's cool. I'm gonna go talk about the wild west of the internet. Oh, that's, right. <laughs> so, that's right. In an hour on um, cable news, which by the way is not even gonna be a thing in like twenty in like twenty years, let alone maybe two years. So like, I just who knows? But I. Yeah, it is. Um, everything old is new again, but I will have to. I do have to say that, like, I'm gonna put it one more time. I'm gonna plug your book in. Um, Thank you, Kate. You're so good. And the and the uh, in the chat. God damn it! I like my stupid external keyboard isn't working. I feel like should most, I do it? Uh, should no, no, I do it? it? I'll do it. I feel like most okay, yeah. of my. I feel like most of like the cursing that I have done in the pandemic is at Bluetooth. Um, oh, I just, because we're technology. Why is Bluetooth still so bad? This is the why question yeah. for our people age. are like, why don't we have AI to decide what's opinion and what's a lie? And I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, like, we can't even we, get Bluetooth to work. Like, I, that is, my life is about navigating which one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. You guys are I, the best. I, um, I, <laughs> I would do this. I just said one other one thing. Can I say? Do you see in the back? There's like a um, there's a speaker and there's like yeah. a little thing going up yeah. from it. So I got a speaker and it, it wasn't uh, it didn't have Bluetooth in it. Um, and I thought like wh like in what kind of crazy world would people have wires? That, <laughs> And I just felt that like this was crazy. And so it turns out that like there's this $8 thing that you buy and you stick it in to the hole where the wire used to go and now you have Bluetooth. So it's, um, it's it, we, 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 we diss Bluetooth, but it is also an amazing technology. I just wanted to say that in fairness. I, my, the vote is out on Bluetooth. I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> I was really appreciating Kate's like skeptical face. I'm like, no, yeah. I hate this. I like, I mean, I, I really, I really legitimately spend at least probably 45 minutes a day struggling with it. And I hate, it drives me, compl even in like systems that are totally set up. And I just like, it drives me nuts. But anyway, I cannot believe we're talking about Bluetooth to end this conversation. But anyway, <laughs> the, um, the book is The Genetic Lottery, Why DNA Matters for Social Equality. Paige Harden, you're... We say this. Are you an American? I think you're an American. You're an American. Are you American? Uh, 
Are you? Ben yeah, has, I am. am I asking? Am I HIPAA violating her? Is that what you're looking at? Yeah, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> I just was not expecting that question. Yes, I am in America. I was not born. I was born in a naval base, but not no. in, in America. But I guess that's U.S. soil. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's a no. Ben always closes the show out with uh, with your great American. So I was trying to continue the tradition. I should have just picked oh. a random country and like. You know. <laughs> Yes, well, and just thank screwed you. with the thank misinformation you, trolls. Um, but yeah. uh, thank you so much for joining us. And this was a really fun way to spend an hour. Sorry for the tech problems. We will be back tomorrow, 22 hours and 53 minutes from yeah, now. Yeah, I can't and... believe you do this every day. Good luck yeah. on cable news. Yeah. Have fun. Oh, yeah, whatever. Uh, until then, <laughs> Scott. Uh, we can't have fun anymore, but we can have social policies to counteract inequalities caused possibly and probably <laughs> by genetic differences. An interesting restatement of this. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to take that clip and we like Princeton 